entertainment, insights. Don't take life too seriously. Welcome to Brainsky Unleashed. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Brainsky Unleashed. Today, we are joined by uh, a brilliant man. I mean, we are talking brilliant. This guy operates in different spaces. He's got a PhD. Uh, he helps businesses. He understands the way the human mind works. Uh, he's grown a business from nothing to $20 million and sold it. I mean, this guy is, he's very, very sharp. So I'm very thrilled to have him on, uh, on the show here. So today we have Bo Bennett. Welcome to the show, Bo. Thank you. It's good to be here. I appreciate the brilliance, but I consider myself just a really, really busy guy. Well, I mean, it sounds like you're busy. So let's just kind of jump right into that. Uh, you know, one of the hottest topics on earth right now, if you pay any attention to the news, happens to be AI. And you've got some things functioning with AI. Can you talk about what you're doing with AI right now? Well, I've been in the publishing industry for about uh, 15 years now. And I have a company, I started a company called ebookit.com, then kind of moved over to Book Marketing Pro. And I realized that AI can be an incredibly useful tool in everything related to publishing. I started with just creating book descriptions. It used to take me a couple hours to read a client's book or just skim it enough, not read the whole thing, but skim it enough, understand it enough to write a good description. But now I, I, the first time I fed it in, I fed in the book, I wrote the prompt. And it's spit out a description that was like many times better than I could have written. And it did it in seconds. So the moment I saw that and realized that, I just dropped everything and realized that, uh, that AI can be an incredibly helpful tool in so many ways. So I started a couple different companies. One is called bookbud.ai. And that allows anybody to come to the site with an idea to write a complete nonfiction book. And it walks you through step by step to, to just, you come with an idea and then you leave with a fully published ebook, print book, and or audio book. How long um, does that take that process? Well, the, the process, it's about three hours of your time. And then the rest of the, the, the time is kind of like waiting for the cover to be developed and so forth, like some things like that. But what you're saying is that I can sit yeah, down right. on your you know, your, your, your website, bookbud. Uh, bookbud.ai. And, right. and I can feed it information about whatever topic I want. And it, about three hours later, I will have the full content of a book written grammat, you know, with, with good grammar, spelling, and everything is good. And, and, and it would be able to be published without having an editor go over it. Yeah. With the, we, with the exception of the timeline there. So the, I mean, you would literally wait like less than an hour for your entire book to be written. So it takes about like maybe 10 minutes to set up and set up the prompts and everything. And you tell the book what to write. It takes about an hour for the book to be written. And then most of the time that's involved, like your time, the other couple hours is involved in kind of like proofing the book, just making sure it's the way you want it. And then doing some other uh, like tasks associated with publishing. But besides that, yes, I mean, it, it's that quick. You can you can literally have like a book published a day. Oh my God. Like just by spending a few hours a day and you, you could have like, you just publish a book a day. And, and I, we've got some clients doing that using one of our plans. And it, it's just amazing because <laughs> I, I've written over a dozen books myself and they, uh, they take a long time. Uh, what, my first book that I wrote, Year to Success, that literally took a year to write. And I, I did it about eight hours a day. Uh, whereas other books, some other books that I've written taken uh, probably um, a, f uh, a few months, a couple hours a day. So so not as time consuming, but still that's nothing compared, compared to, to like a few hours. couple hours. Yeah, I mean, right. in, in less than one eight hour work day, you are essentially right. publishing a book. Now, do you have... Harper Collins or Penguin Publishing or Random House, do they have snipers outside your windows by any chance? <laughs> uh, no, but uh, I've been working with authors for a long time and it's so common. I mean, just like when robots started taking over factory workers and when the internet started taking over some jobs, I mean, there's always people that are horrified of technology and their jobs are threatened. So they have they have a legitimate gripe against the technology, uh, but 
to those people. I say, you're not going to fight it. Or, I mean, you could fight, but you're not, not going to win. win. Yeah. Or, and, and it's unfortunate. You have to start to expand and you got to think how you can use AI to work with you. Um, authors are, are really divided on this because some are like me. When I first saw this, I said, I've got literally a notebook of over a hundred different book ideas. Like all these ideas that I, that I always write down, oh, I would love to write a book on this, but there's no way in my lifetime I could ever do it until now. So it, it's like a way to actually get my ideas out there and get my, my message and use AI for that purpose. So I, I see it incredibly helpful. Other people are just completely threatened by it. Uh, other authors saying that, you know, what, what good am I? Like if, if uh, AI could write a book better than I can, um, and to the, to the answer to that is, well, maybe you're not that good at writing a book, or maybe you shouldn't be wasting your time doing that if a computer could do it better than you can. Move your creative forces over to something else. Maybe write something more like fictional yeah. that AI doesn't, you know, can't currently do too well. Um, and there's always going to be that, that creativity uh, the barrier between machine and human where at least for now, for the time being, for the foreseeable future, human beings have an edge. So that's where you need to kind of focus your energies. And just in, in general, when it comes to AI and, and the threat of AI, I think it's incredibly important just to realize that, uh, that it, it, again, it's here to stay. It's, it's not going anywhere. And in order to succeed, you have to look at how you can use it to your advantage and not try to, to fight it because you're not going to win. Yeah. You know, I, I've been playing with AI lately. Um, I've had AI doing some things for me, which I thought are fascinating uh, just in terms of uh, writing email content or, uh, you know, voicemail scripting or, you know, ridiculous songs or poems that I feel I could make it right and on ridiculous subjects and give it complex words to work in. And it still does it really well, which is impressive. Uh, you know, it, my experience with AI, it's, it's all chat GPT. What, uh, what platforms are you working with? I mean, if, if you've created your, uh, your, your, uh, book bud, what, what backbone of AI was it functioning with? I mean, are you, did you, did you go to a programmer who is good with AI to create your own AI for that purpose? Or are you working off of the platform or, you know, the, the framework of something else? Well, I'm essentially a programmer by trade, so I've been oh, doing God, this for- Oh, God, that too. Okay. Yeah, well, over 25 years. Uh, so I, I, I did most of this myself, but I don't get too impressed because I am using uh, Chat GPT's okay. platform. Okay, so that- They have an amazing like uh, API, yeah. which basically is just an interface where programmers like me can use their technology through like some commands that we, we talk back and forth to each other to get the output that we need, feed them the input that they need. Okay. So I'm using I'm using ChatBT or or OpenAI more technically mm -hmm. as um, as kind of my backbone for a lot of this, along with Eleven Labs technology. Eleven Labs is uh, if you haven't heard of them, they are the uh, the voice cloning AI voice cloning technology. By far, they're the best out there, and uh, so I use them as well to do the narration for the audiobooks. I narrated all my own audiobooks, and I I got to say, like I enjoy the process. But in a way, I hate doing it because after like two hours, my voice is dead and, and it's hoarse and I got a sore throat. So I could only do a couple hours a day and I screw up so much and it's so much editing back and forth. I mean, it is like the, one of the biggest time sucks ever. So I cloned my voice using this technology and now my audiobooks, I just use my cloned voice and within like minutes, the entire audiobook is narrated with my voice and it sounds fantastic it sounds just like me you don't like at this point at and we're looking at uh thursday november 30th 921 in the morning eastern standard time i mean you really uh, time stamped that beautifully I, I had to because like in in our you never know with ai it moves so quickly and i guess my point is that uh like right now ai narration is fantastic for audiobooks because it, it really allows you to speak clearly and smoothly and evenly. And it sounds really good, but it doesn't have that quite, like the same kind of annotations. Like I'm like, I'm talking now kind of like the up and down, which sometimes is good, but sometimes is annoying when, when you just want to hear like a good audiobook. 
But like I said, that could change and the technology is getting more and more like human, if you want to call it that. So it, it's it's just like amazing, amazing stuff. Yeah. So the, the voice, the voice technology, I mean, that's that's one of the things that, you know, it's like when I hear AI speak, you know, I, sometimes I get annoyed with it if it's, you know, it, it doesn't understand voice inflection like the way a human would Right. extremely well. I mean, there are some times where it actually performs just fine. You don't, you don't necessarily know. Uh, but right. other times you're listening to AI and all you want to do is rip your hair out. Like this is garbage, <laughs> you know? So you're saying right. that your audio book uh, that you did with AI doesn't make you want to rip your hair out. So in other words, people who are listening to this podcast or, or watching it and, and seeing your face should get the book and should listen to it because they will actually like it. Yes. Okay. Well, it, and if you think about it, That's it's, it's, it right really there. is different when you're uh, when you're listening to an audiobook, especially a nonfiction audiobook, versus hearing somebody speak like on a podcast. I mean, it's, it's a huge difference, even with voice professional voice actors and, and narrators. It's a different cadence. It, it's smoother. It's it's more even. It, it's kind of more per- professional in a way where you don't have the stuttering. You don't have the ums and ahs and it, like the the inflection the repeated right. words like all of that stuff sounds fine on a podcast and it's engaging yeah but you don't want that in an audiobook when you listen to harry potter you don't hear him stuttering or repeating things i mean you, you hear like the acting but you don't it's different right it, it's definitely more smooth refined professional and that's what the that's what audiobooks are and that's what ai does so ai is really perfect perfect for nonfiction audiobooks at this time and it's incredibly good for fictional audiobooks. And I think it'll be perfect like within six months. So what you're saying is that there's a high probability AI will be able to replace the uh, uh, the people on NPR who have that nice, gentle, easygoing, smooth yeah. tone. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Wow. All yeah. right. Well, that's, I mean, that's exciting and scary at the same time. I it's excited. exciting if you're not one of the people on AP, yeah, NPR. NPR. Exactly. I mean, I, I get excited with, with AI. I get scared with AI at the same time because I, I can see just how, how incredible it is. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated the fact that you took, you took a book and, and, and you said to AI here, you know, you, you imported the book, you, you're doing your prompts. And what most people who don't work with AI need to understand is AI will, it will do nothing for you unless you understand how to prompt it to do something. And, and right. it's not an extremely hard learning curve as far as I'm concerned, because I'm no AI genius, but yet I can drive AI fairly effectively. Uh, you know, you just get used to prompting it and talk to it as if it's a human. Well, you screw that up. And I mean, I actually insult AI. I don't know whether you ever get frustrated with it sometimes, but I'll actually tell AI that was absolute garbage, fix it. Or this is, this is shit. Do that again. And it will apologize and then get it right. I love that. I don't know why I like that so much, but it's kind of well. I'm, I'm careful about that because it, one day, if AI does become incredibly super intelligent, it's come after you, and it controls everything about me and in my life, and it gets pissed off at me. I don't. I don't want it to. Uh, I, I don't want it to do that. So, oh man, I'm, I'm polite. I never thought about that. I'm so screwed in the future. It's going to remember. It's going to know. <laughs> just, just make amends, apologize to it, and I think <laughs> AI is going to kill fine. me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Greensky Unleashed is powered by ProfitMax. Did you know that 93% of businesses overpay on their taxes? Do you pay too much in taxes? A recent study showed that businesses are overpaying between 34 and 71%. ProfitMax has proven legal tax strategy solutions to reduce your tax burden. I'm not only a client, but I even join the team to help other business owners just like me pay only their fair share and nothing more. Go to ProfitMax.co. That's ProfitMax.co. ProfitMax.co to find out more. You can even connect with me there, as you should. And I'll help make sure that your tax bill is legally as low as allowed. Profit Max, keep your catch. All right, so let's uh, let's talk about the fact that um, you're obviously very successful in business. Um, you have a degree, uh, you have uh, a doctoral degree, and you understand how the human um, communicates. You, you really have a grasp for that. Now, a lot of the people that watch my program uh, or that I'm connected to or within my network, uh, they're in business. And there's my us and us. You wouldn't have that with AI. Mm. That's it. I'm going to clone my voice and I'm going to have AI do all my podcasts. Enjoy the interview. Um, But 
what is it that most of us who are in business, small business people, you know, we, we, um, we do our thing every day. We're in the trenches every single day. We have to try and sell to people. We have to communicate with people. We have to listen to people. We have to understand, find needs and fix problems. That is what we get paid to do essentially, right? What is it that we should be looking for on a personal level, either listening for on a phone or looking for, you know, face to face that would actually make us more effective in how we serve our, our, our clients? Uh, th there's a whole, well, I, obviously, you know, there's a whole science of, right. of communication. I'm asking for everything in your doctoral degree in five seconds. Go. Okay. <laughs> uh, communication. It really is true that communication is, is probably like 80% nonverbal. And, and, and I, I want to clarify that a little bit because it's not about like all body language. It's about what is meant versus, versus what is actually said. And that's, that's a huge difference. And that's something that, well, AI can't currently pick up on. And most humans can't pick up on the meaning behind what is said. And, and I don't want to get too political, but if, if you look at what's going on in, in politics with, with uh, the rhetoric and, and speech and the things that people say and the things that people don't say, this is all essentially manipulation. And for the masses, the masses fall for this. They, they, they can't read between the lines. They can't see the true information and pick out what's really being said and what's really meant within the words. They, they have like a, um, a lower level understanding of human communication. And that allows people to be manipulated. And whether you we're talking about just like daily life and politics, or if we're talking about, um, you know, religion, social issues, or if you're talking about business. Uh, so that's, it, it is kind of important to understand the basis of hum, uh, human communication and to really try to learn and better understand uh, what people are actually saying and, and what is actually true versus what isn't true. What could we look I mean, for to find out if we're being manipulated? I mean, you know, every time Joe Biden speaks, which at this point, it sounds like just gibberish, but every time yeah. the man speaks, we're basically being lied to. You know, every time Trump speaks, we're basically being lied to. These are our options, by the way, we're in great shape. Um, yeah. You know, how do we know when we're being lied to? Well, there's, there's like, a, you can't tell all the time. Because you don't have access to that information, the the less information that's being communicated to you, it, it's more difficult to parse through that and get the truth. But when you when you hear people speak over and over, um, then then that they provide more information, and that allows you to get more of more of what's true. But to answer your your direct question, one of the best ways that we could differentiate, like between what is true and what is not true is through multiple sources and multiple good sources. Uh, How do you even one, identify one, that anymore? Because can you trust the news? I can't. Exactly. The, uh, I mean, this gets really deep into critical thinking ah, and, and what, the what can be trusted, right? Um, but for example, the, there's the different people and with different goals have done a very good job in casting doubt on virtually everything like just what you said you know how could you trust the thing and and it's not unreasonable i mean it, it's not unreasonable to say you can't trust the news especially um depending on what news you actually watch right where you get your news from or where you get your whether what news you read or whatever uh, so that's not the unreasonable thing the, the unreasonable is being able to you you have to trust something you have to get your information from somewhere and what most people most people don't do is say oh i can't trust what this person is saying i can't trust what that person is saying therefore i'm going to remain skeptical and i'm going to remain open and i'm going to lean towards where the evidence leads and and that's you know what is evidence but that's another topic most people don't say that most people say um Let's just pick one side, for example. Let's say that uh, Trump is telling people the um, the FBI is all corrupt, uh, the Justice Department is corrupt, the legal system is corrupt, everybody is corrupt except for him. So you could either say, okay, um, like all those organizations, everything is corrupt, 
And, but I'm going to say, I'm going to believe like with faith that Trump is the only one that's right yeah. and not corrupt. So, I mean, obviously that's not critical thinking and you could do the same thing. Like if just say Joe Biden or something says that, um, the FBI can be trusted. Trump says, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like it, like it's all a lie yeah. and he's, and I mean, if you just believe like what one person says, because you have like an ideological leaning towards that person, or if they happen, you happen to agree with them politically or something, that's not critical thinking. That's not the way things work. So uh, the short answer is you really have to be good at understanding what evidence actually is and, uh, and being able to, to use evidence in, into developing your thoughts and, and differentiating between what's true and what's not true. And then he, just like critical thinking too, and, and just um, a lot of people really focus on plausibility and that is not the way to think. And what I mean by that is if you, if you do have like an ideological leaning, let's say that uh, like Joe Biden is like my God and yeah. I believe everything he says or whatever. And if, if he starts saying things, then, and I just believe him because he agrees with me, well, that's the confirmation bias. And that's one of the biggest uh, problems with critical thinking. You can't do that. Uh, it, you, you can't just because what he says, if it's plausible, meaning it makes sense to me and it, I, it feels good when he says it, it's plausible, then that's not the way to look at it. The way to look at things is through probability. What's more probable? Probability is where math comes in and statistics and, and there's like, it, it's more objective. Like you can, you can like run numbers, you can get mathematicians. So a, an example is what is more probable? Is it more probable that like every institution in the United States is completely corrupt and against Trump, or is it more probable that maybe Trump is uh, not telling the truth? Like, so like, or two I, things can be true at the same time. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you could look at, you could look at probability and uh, versus plausibility, but people don't always do that. Yeah. You know, I, um, I was, uh, as, as you can't, you can't watch the news lately without hearing lies. Um, yeah. you know, I, I, I guess there's no way of, of identifying just by, by a certain type of body language or anything like that, whether someone's telling the truth or not, which is unfortunate. Uh, well, well, no, also, because many people, especially like in the news, they, they probably don't know if they're telling the truth or not, or they believe it. Right. Uh, and they the believe problem. what they're actually saying. So they've been convinced, yeah. they've been manipulated. Yeah. Uh, and and that, that doesn't usually happen with like newscasters, like just reading, reporting news, but it happens with opinion people, right. people who aren't newscasters, but they're just they're entertainers. Yeah, I heard. Uh, I heard recently, and this this to me was the the one of the greatest, most asinine statements I've ever heard. Um, you know about you know the Israel conflict and and all this other stuff. Uh, there was someone who was um, being interviewed, and she was basically saying, a pro Hamas person, uh, basically saying that the, the tunnels under Israel were built by Hamas, not for terrorism or anything like that, but they were built to help move school supplies around Gaza. I mean, okay. holy yeah. crap. I mean, that is yeah. such an asinine stretch of unconscionable imagination. Yet, right. wow, there are people who actually believe that. I mean, you want to talk about so that's a, that's a perfect example. Yeah, like a, a statement like that, that, like a critical thinker. What you would do is you could say the first thing that you say is, "Okay, um, where is the evidence for that?" Right. Like, just show me the evidence, or like, forget about the fact that uh, it it doesn't really make any sense. Uh, which we we can't fully understand. We have to understand our ignorance. One of the first things they do critical thinking is understand that, like, where you are ignorant. I am not into construction. I don't know anything about building tunnels or the reasons for them. So I have to understand that it is possible that like they could be built for any reason. But then you have to look at who is saying this. Is this somebody who's like supporting that, like Hamas, right. I guess. Uh, and then you have to say, okay, there's a huge motivation there. Then you have to look at it and, and you could use the plausibility test, which is like, say, okay, is this plausible? Does this make sense to me? And then it's like, no, this doesn't make sense to me. 
And then you go, you go a little bit deeper and you go into the, 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 the probability, like what, what is the chance that they actually did this for some perfectly good, legitimate reason, like moving school supplies versus, yeah. I mean, you know, so then, so, I mean, that's just a way to think about things, but I, I, it really comes down to evidence. Like if somebody is making a claim that seems so outrageous like that, like on the surface, they have the burden of proof to support that claim. And you shouldn't believe in that claim until it could properly be supported. So as a consumer of news, critical thinker, you would hear that and you would say, yeah, that doesn't pass the sniff test and they didn't provide any, every, any evidence for it. Therefore, I'm going to ignore it. Have we I'm left, not going to accept that as fact. But have we left a world? Have we left uh, a, a reality at this point, I guess? where burden of proof is not necessary anymore? Uh, no, uh, burden of proof will still be necessary whether people demand it. Uh, that's another story. When people ask for it, that's another story. Uh, I, I get what you're saying and it's completely true. I mean, people say these ridiculous of things. True. Everything I say is true. Providing any <laughs> proof for it or any evidence. And, uh, and it just like goes over people's head. They they just accept it, and that's uh, that's not the way to to think. So how how can we as citizens of society, in your opinion, how can we as a society turn the other direction and start critically thinking again? Well, you have to learn about critical thinking. I think um, that. I mean, right now, as an adult, anybody could learn critical thinking. There is like a biological genetic component to thinking critically, but there's also a learned component, just like pretty much any, any personality trait, anything it's part genetic and uh, part environmental, but you, it can be learned. Everybody could get better at it. That's pretty much a fact. So you start there. Like there are, there are many different books. Uh, I, I write a bunch of them about critical thinking on the, on the foundations of critical thinking, on what logical fallacies are and what cognitive biases are, understanding the way our brain works. Um, and it, it seems like it's a mistake, but it, it actually helps us uh, survive and reproduce. And that's why we have these cognitive biases for the most part to keep us alive. It, it's the proper functioning of our brain. It's not, it's not a problem. It only becomes a problem when we try to use our brain in this modern world of information, then it becomes a problem. But if we understand these cognitive biases, what they are and how to identify them, then that's a really good step in critical thinking. And the same thing goes with uh, logical fallacies. These are, these are problems, errors within arguments that for the, for the average person, it just goes overhead. We don't see it. But if you understand what logical fallacies are and you can see them, in like an argument, then you, you're going to start thinking better because you're not going to accept information that's not true. You're not going to accept that arguments and you're going to start seeing more clearly and being able to differentiate the truth from falsehood. So if you were, if you were standing in front of a class in a university, because I believe that is one place that critical thinking has died. So mm -hmm. let's say some university somewhere hired you to reteach the concept called critical thinking because they stopped it many years ago and we've now got a society where no one actually does it. And you were told that you have a few minutes to just sell people on a couple of very basic concepts for how to critically think, right? So uh, they're gonna test you out and, and say, you know, Bo, could you just tell this class of 30 people uh, three tips on critical thinking that chances are they're not doing, what would they be? Well, I guess the first one I, I did mention before is understand your own biases, understand where you're flawed in your thinking and confirmation biases is one of them. Most of us will just accept information that are, that we already agree with. So listen, uh, we are uh, unfortunately running out of time here. Uh, I thought this was actually a lot of fun talking to you. Uh, obviously incredibly brilliant and I thoroughly enjoyed this. If you do come up with the fact that you are perfectly, and I mean perfectly in the middle, you're not being self-aware. Well, thank you so much for joining.